Okay guys, let's start. Do it in English because it's re recorded and maybe someone else would like to see it too. Let's speak Dutch. Um, let's try to make it as interactive as uh, possible. Um, I don't have a solution today. And most of the times maybe we give a, a course and then tell you how to do it and what the solution is. But um, this is rather complex and I'm working now in this field for 25 years I guess. And I don't have a solution right now, um, this is, so this is a lot of considerations. But let me explain exactly uh, what the complexity is. Uh, in, in um, yeah, it's, it's also, it also has to do with software security. It has to do with, uh, I call it secured resources or secured assets. And um, yeah, it's very complex. There is a lot and there are a lot of parties involved and how to secure for everyone that he just get access to what he would like to be is not so easy. And as you can see, I have here, it's in Dutch, but um, this is from, I guess, Monday, yeah, yesterday. And here you see that, again, uh, you have access to a system and you can see data that you're not supposed to see. Hmm? And there are uh, numerous of these kind of examples of uh, that you have access to a system and uh, once you're logged in, you can, you can uh, access all the data, uh, in fact, that you're not allowed to, to see. Uh, another thing that has to do with um, this subject, this is from some uh, time ago, 1995, uh, Barry's bank went um, uh, bankrupt because of a guy uh, who could speculate uh, on, the, on the market with shares and uh, uh, it didn't end up uh, very well. So he, he, he need to cover again and again what he has lost before. And in the end, you know, there was so much outstanding that uh, he could not l not longer uh, cover it anymore and then the whole bank went uh, bankrupt. And that was uh, Nick, uh, Nick Leeson who did it for Barron's Bank. Um, and here you can see that someone is allowed to do actions within his company. Uh, and in fact, he was not allowed to do that. So the system gave him um, the opportunity to do these kind of things. Well, in fact, he was not allowed to do it because he was arrested after that and has been in prison for several years. I don't know how long. Yeah. So this is another example of um, how um, important it is to secure all your assets. Uh, if you have any questions in the meanwhile, please ask them directly. Huh? Because as I said, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a hard uh, subject. Another uh, software security issue. Microsoft PowerPoint has a kind of problem it needs to close. Segmentation violation or something like that from Microsoft. <laughs> I get it all the time. If you start it up the second time, it's no problem. So we'll do that. Okay, so secured resources. Hmm. So here are some items I would like to discuss uh, today. Hmm? So we have uh, business assets. What are assets? 
uh, you have your organization. Um, uh, what type of organization uh, do you have? How is your organization structured? Uh, we have virtual and physical assets and services. So not only physical assets, you have virtual assets too. Um, you have uh, actors uh, that, are, that acts on the physical assets, but also on the virtual assets, of course. Um, I have uh, put there users, groups, and others. And as you will see, it's not so easy that just user and groups or user and roles, it's not, not so easy. And there are a lot of other things, like you have other equipment, um, but you also have external parties. Yeah. And within that parties, you also have groups or users or consumers or whatever who wants to interact with your system too. Uh, we have authentication and authorization. What's the difference between the two? And um, maybe a little bit hot at this moment, federated uh, management, like yeah, federated uh, identity management, which gives you the opportunity to do, for instance, a single sign-on. Business assets. Who can add something to this list, uh, guys? This is something I came uh, up with. Like we have people, employees, management, shareholders, customers, whatever. Reputation. Sorry? Reputation. Reputation itself. The reputation itself. You want reputation to. Of the, company. of the company, its name, its brand name. Yeah. Um, Definitely, yeah, and that's kind of um, maybe physical information or digital information, isn't it? So you have to register, like you have to register pay, uh, patents, and yeah, that could be one uh, one type. But the other type is that's rather virtual, isn't it? Your your real brand name, how you have put your yeah. your brand into the market, yeah, yeah. Def definitely. Uh, goodwill, um, definitely, yeah, because that um, could could uh, indicate the value of your company, yeah? absolutely, yeah. And those are rather important values because your reputation, for instance, if you have like uh, a leeson, yeah, it's a very good example in this case, then the reputation of your bank is directly yeah, back to zero, definitely, yeah. Um, but information in here, yeah, that might be digital uh, information. And as soon as you have that, the information itself is part of the information. And now it becomes a little bit uh, abstract uh, already. So we have uh, people and locations, equipment, information, all kinds of other things like reputation. But as soon, um, for instance, as the, uh, you can see information, and as soon as the information is part of the information, yeah, then uh, you, should, you should secure that too. So you want to secure all your information yeah, that goes through your business, and as soon as your information is part of that, you have to secure that too. So that makes it already a little bit abstract. So you have layer on layer. Um, and each item needs some level of protection. Um, and that, that can be physical, like you have a fence, for instance. So that's physical, uh, secured, like a building. Um, and a lot of the other things is uh, secured by Yes, software or hardware um, more virtual, yes? so you have to identify yourself, who you are, and that might uh, then give some security on the things you, you can access. So, but also the hardware can be um, driven, so the hardware uh, security can be driven by software security. And like you have um, a card that gave you access, but uh, whenever the card gives you access to what location, for instance, normally that's, uh, with, that's regulated by software. So again, the software then regulates the hardware 
protection. So there's no, there's no such a thing as it's a simple division of, okay, here you can put hardware security, and there we have some software security. And no, because in the end, it's, uh, most of the time it's always that's put Almost always, yeah. Except maybe you have some hardware key in which you can yeah. unlock something. Yeah, then it might be real, uh, but a lot of times it's driven by software. Yeah. So if you scan, for instance, um, has something that you can recognize a person, let's suppose something like that, then um, and it has to be kept within some other system that you can match yeah, against. Um, so again, software, isn't it? But is it not uh, a combined a hardware security uh, combined with software security? Because yeah, the scanners are hardware. That's also part of the security. Yeah, but that's that's just a part of the whole security path. Yeah? Um, but you can have uh, the super security without the scanner. So. Yes, but you have, let's say you have a scanner for, for instance, an iris scan yeah, or a fingerprint scan. Yeah. Then that's not uh, the thing that secure uh, your access. Yeah, that would be a fence with a lock. And it will be unlocked once you identify yourself as being that. So uh, the scanner itself, that's uh, a subject, a part of the identifying process. And it's not re really the, the thing that secured eh, the location, that secures the location. So that will be the real hardware. But you can enter it maybe by bypassing or doing of eh, harming um, the software, eh, like the scanner or something within the process that's doing the matching. You can also like by faking the iris or something. Yeah, let's say the machine is... Yeah, yeah but you're faking then... The take it yeah. off and just uh, make contact with two wires, and yeah, the same thing. Yeah, maybe it's just yeah, but that's that's again security. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what you can do, like with alarm systems, yeah. hey, if you cut the wire, then the alarm will go off automatically. So there's detection in there whether everything is still connected to it. Yeah, but that's why the iris uh, scan is also part of the security it's system. Like a combined yeah, it's part of the whole yeah. system. Yeah. Absolutely. But it yeah. isn't the responsible um, decision, the logical part. And I see what you mean, it isn't the logical part, it isn't the place where it's determined this place, this person has access, yes or no, but... Yeah, but it's the, it's the complexity of the whole. Eh? Yeah. So it's, you cannot say just, I put a fence there, uh, with a gate, and that's it. Eh? So now I have secured my location, for instance, so it's not that easy. And that also um, uh, accounts for um, virtual systems, yeah, like computers. So you can say, well, you have no access to it, but well, probably you have. Yeah, so al also there you have a lot of um, items that plays a role within yeah, the whole security uh, path. And therefore it's so complex. So you cannot easily say, uh, if I configure it here, then I'm done. It's so tremendously complex. Yeah. So you have to do with a lot of uh, assets that you want to protect, and you protect them in uh, all kinds of different ways. But in the end, it's uh, the complexity of the of the whole um, uh, that might make it secure or not secure. And at how many places would you like to define your security rules? Uh, that's that's the biggest issue, because uh, the more at the more places you have to define security rules the more complex it becomes, and the more error-prone, too. And uh, the cost uh, itself um, it will increase dramatically by having uh, all kinds of systems that will do all kinds of protection on all kinds of items. It's, yeah, that is, uh, that's well. a decision you will always have to make because you don't want a single point of failure either. That's another, that is another issue. Because um, a single point of failure, that's another totally other dimension 
of at how many places you would like to be able to define your security rules. And you can say, okay, I want to have a central system in which I can define eh, only at one spot, I would like to define my security rules. That would be nice. Yeah, define it here, then throughout the whole organization, um, yeah, um, it can be used. So it can be used at gates and it can be used at software systems, for instance. Yeah? Exactly the same rules that you apply at a central system. And then you have, yeah, but if the central system goes down, then that will be yeah, then uh, not so good because no one can use it then anymore. And then you have to think about, okay, how can I secure that only the central system, and that if that goes down, that it will be taken over at some other point. And that's another question. So you're not going to solve that by saying then, okay, I split it up in 100 different pieces, <laughs> all doing their own things. Clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you take a look at uh, data flow, so the arrows here now represent data flow within organization. You see that you have data flow within the internal organization. Yeah, that's clear because you do your business. And then within the business, you can see that you have data flow for, uh, from department to another department. Uh, but you also have data flow with all kinds of external uh, parties, yeah, like uh, customers, suppliers, shareholders, whatever, uh, part financial institutes, uh, government, uh, call it. You have to do with all kinds of uh, um, parties outside your own organization. And you would like to share data, information with them. Uh, within the internal organization, um, you're responsible about the structure yeah. as a company. As a company, normally you can determine your own internal organization and you can choose for some structure. Yeah, you have different, uh, I don't know about structures. Yeah, Do you know about structures? Yeah. Yeah, you have a lot of structures, yeah, lot like... Of discovered a few uh, structures, like uh, the market structure, or just any. So yeah, you have, uh, for instance, uh, a very traditional structure. It's like you have a CEO, yeah, and then uh, with yeah, departments. Yeah, and all the employees and yeah. all the departments. You have flat structures with not too many uh, management in between. Bureaucratic, Bureaucratic structures, uh, functional structures, structures defined on functions. Yeah. Yeah. All types, and all types of hybrid uh, yeah. structures too. Uh, yeah. um, okay, so, but here you can then define, okay, uh, depending on the structures, for instance, I would like to give um, authorization uh, to people within the organization, what they might uh, do and don't, might, uh, might do. Um, the external part is it's a lot more difficult because you, you cannot say, okay, uh, I would uh, have your external party uh, organized like that. So that's, a, that's a, a small difference between the two. Uh, think about that you have to implement so you have a structure, you have an organization, and you want to uh, build a system for that organization. Uh, so the system should support all the business processes. Uh, think about that. Uh, and within the business processes, you have all kinds of uh, roles and uh, authorization. And you have to um, be able uh, to support that by your system. And that the same accounts and two external parties. Uh, so um, if you want to give external parties access to your data too, then that should be restricted, of course, and how you're going to implement that. Um, I make a distinction between virtual and physical uh, resources because I want to go more and more to the virtual resources, of course. So, how do you access virtual? Because a physical resource, you can protect, in fact, by a virtual resource. Um, if you have a system, and you only by that system, by a simulated system. Let's let explain that first point. Uh, if it, we take a look at business information systems, you have all categories of software systems, 
but we, we are going to take a look at business information systems. So we have a business, and um, a business information system is meant to support as much as possible of the business processes within a business. And that's what we call then a business information system. And like uh, you have ERP uh, packages like uh, SAP and things like that, they try to, uh, to support as much as possible within a business um, of the business processes. Um, and if you take a look at that, what it is, in fact, is a simulation of uh, more or less the real world. world. Um, if you try to visualize it for yourself, and you take a look at uh, a business and then the flow of data within the business, then you can uh, almost see the papers uh, flowing around. Um, so, and that's the real world effect. So how it's implemented, whether it's implemented by a digital world, a virtual world, or, b or by a physical world, like with papers, as it was you know, years uh, before, um, there's not really a difference in what the business can do or don't. Yeah? There's not really whether you simulate it or you do it with physical stuff. You can still run the business. Is that clear? Yeah, it might take a much, uh, uh, much more time and much more resources if you do it with physical stuff, of course. But, in, but the idea is that you, that you can still do the same. And if you take a look at that, then, for instance, someone at a desktop yeah, he has all those boxes with those papers and he take one of the pile, <laughs> going to fill that in and send it to another one who's responsible for the next step. And that's more or less how you can take a look at how a business is running and how data flows throughout a uh, business. And what you can do then is try to catch those items and to translate them into virtual items. And we will come back to that. But then what you will have are business objects. And so you see, see all kind of objects within your business, entities, and you can catch them and uh, you give them a name. And in fact, then you have a business object. And you see items that go uh, from one, um, let's say, uh, from one role or one position within the business to another one. It might be a department or might be a role, that's depending on how the business is structured. Um, and those are business objects too. And in that way you can make a virtual representation, a uh, model of, um, of your business. And that's what I would like to do, because then you have a representation, a model of your business, um, and that gives you insight about how things are working. And if you do that with business objects, yeah, at least then you have kind of formal representation, formal model of your specific business. Um, so you can make there, you know, let's say, a diagram of that. So think a business object like, like a customer you know, or an invoice, all that kind of things, you know, an order. And then you can also see that, uh, for instance, take an order. Uh, that goes through an organization. Yeah. It's uh, from the moment that's ordered by a customer until the moment that the uh, product that has been ordered is delivered to the, to the customer. Yeah. So you can see that something like that flows through the whole organization. Yeah. And you can imagine them as objects and then because it's running in a business we call them business objects. Uh, and what I said just before it, that's that they have dynamic behavior. So you can model it like we have an order and we have an invoice and we have a customer and have an employee and all the, those objects. Um, but that's not a running system. Yeah? But once you're running it in a business, then it has dynamic behavior. It's, it's really, it has a life. Yeah? Each business object has, has a life cycle for uh, a certain moment, it could be a long period, a short period, depends on the business object. Are business objects uh, some kind of enterprise resource? Because they support the uh, business in, of the organization in their uh, core business. It's, it, it's in fact, it's anything that you can distinguish as some separate item within your business. That's what you call a business object. So what do you mean with enterprise resources? So any resource, in fact, that you have, any asset that you have, that's uh, definitely a business object. Yeah? Yeah? Okay.
Okay, we'll come back to that uh, later too. Because uh, another important feature of business objects are their states. And uh, a lot of times it's not integrated uh, yeah, within a model. But if you take, for instance, an order, uh, it's created by a customer. The customer is calling a department or entering a website or whatever. And he's putting an order. So he creates an order. But uh, that's, not, that's uh, something totally different than delivered. In the end, the order has been handled and the products uh, ordered are delivered. And so you can see that you have a whole state diagram through which uh, the order will go um, through the organization. And there are moments that it has to be approved and has to be checked, validated, etc., etc. has to be paid, things like that. And all kind of um, states that a business object can exist in. Is that clear? And you go from state to state, you go through um, from a certain action. So you perform an action on a business object and perform an action on a business object mostly means that it goes to another state. And whether you are allowed to perform that specific action depends on your authority within the organization. So not everyone is allowed to perform all actions on all business objects. Might be clear. Take a look at Leeson. He was doing things that he was not allowed to do. Um, is that clear so far? So can you imagine already, visualize uh, for yourself that you have their all kind of objects going around within a business and that all kind of players are doing things on them and maybe they are allowed to do it or not. And it depends on all kind of things. Okay. So now we have uh, business objects and you have a multi-dimensional access there. Take a business object, um, like a, a customer. Um, it can be that you, and take another one like an order, it can be that a, a certain role within the organization is allowed just to see customers. And another one is allowed just to see orders and another one allowed to see both. Could be. So then we have three different roles and we can say, okay, I give you access with this role, I give you access to customer, I give you access to invoice, I give you access to order, to whatever. So that's one dimension of authorization that you can give to business objects. Uh, but is that sufficient? Will that satisfy most of the times? the authorization within your business. And because then I can um, secure my business entities, can I? I can say, okay, this role, you're responsible for customers, so you have access to customers. No, because you have uh, about external parties. So explain. Uh, yeah, you have to also uh, declare the clearances for the extent. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what? Let me. I, I always draw living objects like this. Yeah. So if you have a class diagram, um, we do uh, something like that, and we put in a name here like order. So that's the name of our business object. It's an order. Yeah. And now it's uh, in a running system. Um, we make instances of an order. Yeah? So an external party, let's say an external party is putting an order at our company. Yeah? So this is order one. And another external party is putting there another order, yeah? order two. And I think this is what you mean, so that uh, party one is not allowed to see the order of party two. Yeah? Yeah. So you, um, you would give access to orders yeah, to an external par party, but only to his own yeah. orders and not to the orders of someone else. Okay. So that on instance? That's on instance, yeah. exactly. So what does this mean for your system? That this will survive a uh, piece of vision for most organizations. <coughs> Sorry, that uh, this will be enough for organizations 
your question was, will this be sufficient for... Yeah, that was the question on type. Eh? So if you ah, say, okay, um, because you're going to say an external party, okay, uh, you get access to orders. Clear. Because if you don't give access to orders, uh, then he won't be able to see his own orders. But if you say, okay, I give access to orders, then uh, it might not be the case that he has access to all orders within the system, because not all orders are his orders. Hmm? So you only want to give access to his own specific orders. But someone within the organization, in the internal organization, uh, has access to orders, but might have access to all orders, but maybe not. <laughs> Again, there too. So within the internal organization, the same accounts. Like you have different uh, departments, could be eh, that you have departments for different um, industries, let's say something like that, and one from one industry someone puts an order, and from another industry someone puts an order, and you don't want to have that, <coughs> yeah, the, the two can see all orders of all industries, could be, eh, something like that, I don't know, but it depends on how you structure your internal organization. And sometimes you don't want to have any person within the organization that can see anything that goes around there. And that would be number three. And now number three. It might be, uh, let's um, keep it to orders, why not, uh, that very large orders are not accessible to anyone or to everyone. So only specific persons might have access to, yeah, let's say, very valuable orders, could be. So then you have something on a specific attribute, because the value of the order is not the instance, mm -hmm. the instance is the order, but it's an, an attribute of the instance. So you have additional rules uh, depending on values of attributes on instances. And it's not only that, it's also that might those, those characteristics might change the workflow. So you have a specific value on a specific instance that might say then, okay, the state diagram will then be different from a regular instance. Yeah, it might be different versions, different Diff yeah, diff yeah, because it needs, for instance, an additional improvement. Yeah? Could be easily the case. If you if it's higher than this, then we need additional improvement from higher management or uh, or another role within my structure. Where would time, uh, location, and um, um, the state of let's say uh, order be under? Is that also a, an attribute value? Yeah, it depends on how you model your business, of course. Eh? But um, you mean the time that an order has been uh, played, that someone has placed well, let's an order? Say, uh, I only want people to be able to access uh, um, their orders from the past 30 days. But you want the company to be able to um, be able to track all the orders of the person in their lifetime. You also need to make policies for that. Oh, in practice, you always have to think also about practice, of course. Restricting on time, that's interesting. Because that makes the system inflexible. If then, okay, if you say... Maybe you need this isn't the best... Um, but but again, if, 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 if it will be... Uh, want an uh, employee to access uh, assets during work time, so to mitigate them uh, doing stuff uh, outside at home and stuff like that, that would be location again. Is that an attribute value or...? No, because probably it will account then for all instances, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that will oh, more okay. be a characteristics of the um, accessibility of the, of the whole system. Eh? So you might restrict, you might put restrictions on that too. That you say, oh, you're only allowed from a certain location to access the system, or from uh, within uh, from uh, within a certain time um, period. Yeah, yeah. So that's more a restriction on accessing the system. It won't be a restriction on an instance 
like like the business object uh, there itself. But the business object um, is that real business? Yeah, account. Yeah? You have kind of account, and it, ki it could be a restriction on account. And then if you say account, the restrictions on account, uh, they uh, will be taken in, into account whether you are able to log in or not to the to access or not the system. Yeah. But I could also imagine examples where you would be able to always log in, but only access instances with specific attributes, let's say time and location. Yeah, but then it will be on the specific. But then it will be on a specific attribute. Yes. Yeah. So you have two different things there. Yeah. But um, those specific things you have to think about flexibility too because the more secure normally the more secure you make your system the more inflexible it becomes yeah? and the more inflexible it becomes it harder it's much harder to maintain so those things go hand in hand and the more costly it will be in operation in terms of operation so the more inflexible it is the more the harder it is to maintain and the more costly it is. There was just an announcement or... No, that was not just now. But if you take into account that if you have, uh, for instance, uh, all kinds of passwords and all kinds of systems, and for a regular, uh, like a like, uh, uh, middle-sized company or something, it costs about five million a year just to maintain all those passwords. It's incredible. Hmm? Yeah. So that's a really tremendous hard job. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment with the federated identity. You know. This clear? Now, if you take the, a look at your structure of your organization, then you uh, traditionally you said, uh, take a look at uh, Linux, for instance, uh, or their, uh, Windows, whatever. You have users and groups. Um, but will this satisfy um, everything? And whether you call them groups or roles, whatever. It's just a name, in effect, isn't it? And, and what you do then, if you, um, uh, if you define a new user within your system, you assign that user to a specific group or more groups. You say you are part of this and that and that group. And then on the group, you specify the authorizations. Mm -hmm. So uh, assigning a user to a group gives him then certain authorization within uh, the, the system that uh, you gave him access to. Is that clear? And then you can call it a group or a role. It doesn't matter that much. This is what um, the role-based um, access uh, systems are doing. So uh, our RBAC, role-based access control systems. And this is in fact what they do. So they say, okay, you define a new account um, and we give uh, that account as part of that role and that role has those um, authorizations. But that's normally, it's a separate system. So we have a business information system and then below that, you have an R system. So, so how are you going in this? How are you going to define all those different instances and values on instances? How are you going to do that? I don't think it's... How could you do it? Any idea? Is it possible? Anyway. Yeah, it's possible, but it's not very efficient, I think. You can put the instances in each the group, but... Well, what, what sometimes um, has been done, that it, that's... So, this system here... Access a database with yeah, all kind of tables. And what you can do is you can put some definitions here in the database that restricts access to certain users. Yeah, that's 
sometimes uh, a way that has been that it will be done. So then this is specifying all those definitions there that gives access to database tables and columns and things like that. And this one is accessing that hmm? all those and then goes through that uh, layer. But you can see there's a there's no correlation then between the counts here and there, so you have to duplicate uh, them all. A very hard job. What do you mean with uh, you need to duplicate them? Um, once you you create a new account here, you also have to create a new account here. And you so you assign here, yeah, you assign it to a certain role within this system. Um, but then here you have to duplicate all the rules of that role because there's no correlation between the two. But can't you just make the correlation? Yeah, exactly. Because I know this is uh, uh, what Active Directory does, exactly this, and you have mirrors and stuff like that. Is that yeah, but that's on this level. Hmm? So here we have Active Directory, that's just the definition database of the roles and the authorization rules. But that's not correlated to that one because my business information system, will it make use of Active Directory? Could be, but not necessarily. But you want to try to make a business, well, uh, if, uh, design your business in a way that it does use um, your RPEC system to migrate time and cost and stuff like that. Um, well, obviously, you need something here. Huh? That's clear. But are you going to use a specific RBAC system to implement it? That's an other issue. And then again, um, if you do, so then you're locked with a certain RBAC system, aren't you? And it should also be able then to put all the rules that you need into that. Because if it doesn't fit everything you want, then it's useless. But that's what uh, most well, here, if we're talking about software, that's indeed what most big software uh, vendors are doing. But um, small uh, software vendors, they are using a lot of, I'll call them connectors, so that, that you're uh, making it so that you're not vendor locked in. So there are some ways around it. Yeah, but there's also uh, another problem is um, the character characteristics of your business objects can be different than what RBAC supports for you. So it might be a big hassle to make that one-to-one. -one, yeah? So it's not always that easy. We come back to that within, if I have... Uh, an example of it, you will see. It's not so easy. Um, the, there are different levels of uh, where you put authorization rules huh, from uh, what's uh, currently uh, more or less um, in the way th th it has been done. So, at operating system level, yeah, that's the most traditional way. So, you, you can put file attributes on files, and let's say you are not uh, allowed to see this document. So you put then file attributes on that document, or put it in a specific directory, things like that. Um, on network level, and you can give uh, by all kinds of access lists, uh, access control lists, you can say, okay, you have access to this resource and to that resource. Um, and on top of that, you have the uh, RBAC uh, systems, okay? Ident identity management uh, and access management systems. Um, but it's a layer in between. So your applications has to confirm, you know, has to be able to communicate with that system. If they don't, then it's, it's even harder. Okay? Uh, at the database level, so what I explained just before, that's it's, it has really been done. It's not that it's not done. And into your business information system itself. Yeah, that's 
probably the most suitable way to do it. But. And the other thing is that um, if you have a role, then there might be different access rules again. And you can say uh, I'm a manager of a department, so that's my role. And another person um, is also manager of a department, so yeah, same role. But it might be that they have access to different instances or even different uh, object types. Then hmm? you can use inheritance, make a role for um, management of department X and uh, people manager and asset manager role and then they inherit that role. That would be a solution. Yes, but you specify different roles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. So you have generic roles, you say everyone within the business has these generic roles and then going down the inheritance tree of roles then it's getting more and more specific, definitely. You can apply the same um, uh, object oriented uh, techniques. Uh, there. Uh, what's the difference between authentication and authorization? Authentication is um, MIA. Person who I say I am, and uh, authorization is am I allowed to do something? And so, to to give authorization, also you always need to be authenticated. Okay. Before, without authentication, uh, you are kind of anonymous user of the system, anonymous person. So you first need to be authenticated, and then you can get some authorization. So that also means that. Um, when you authenticate yourself to a system, that the system knows who you are and that you can, and then you're a business object. And that from that moment on, in fact, you're a living a business object within the system. As that specific person. And that specific person might be assigned to certain roles uh, and, there, and with that to certain permissions, etc. Um, one other thing, you have a whole lot of uh, applications uh, these days. Uh, a business has multiple applications and you to access multiple uh, uh, websites, whatever. And one big uh, hurdle there is uh, all the passwords that you have for all those different systems. And keeping track of all those passwords, that's also insecure, of course, because most of the uh, most people write them down on paper or on a note or somewhere locally because you hardly can remember all those passwords. Um, and what might help there is single sign-on. That's also federated service. So it goes hand in hand with federated identity and access management. Um, and single sign-on will help you anyway. And that might be clear. So whatever system you have, um, I think it's, it's very useful to always put in there the mechanism of single sign-on and make use of federated service. Yeah, whether you're the only user <laughs> of the federated service or not, but make use of federated service. And then you can say, for instance, if you take federated service of Google, so you know how that works, then hey, you have a Google account. And if my system will make use of the federated service of Google, it goes to um, the Google uh, service and ask is this person allowed to log in? Uh, Google uh, checks whether it is already logged in. If it is, it gives you back a token. And if it isn't, if you're not logged in yet, Google will take care of the login um, process. Hmm? So your application don't need to do that. Is that clear? And that's what then called single sign-on. So another application can use the same mechanism also goes to a Google uh, login service, ask whether is this person allowed to log in or not. If it's already logged in, it, get, it receives a token, it's, yeah, it's already logged in, and otherwise takes care of the login process. So multiple systems can then use the same login, and you only, ha and you only have to log in once. Anyway, if you take a look at um, a small example, this is from uh, a real system, in fact. Ah, so, 
let me show you some of the difficulties you have within a real application. Um, a real application is um, a group purchasing organization. Um, we had uh, until a year, about five years ago within the Netherlands, we had um, inkoop organisaties, uh, is that in Dutch? We had uh, big um, uh, group purchasing organisations for mortgages. The hypotheek inkoop combinaties. And what they did, they had, um, so you have a single um, group purchasing organisation, an inkoop organisatie, and they have assigned to them lots of uh, sub-agents. Uh, could be thousands easily in the Netherlands. So they have thousands of different companies that had a contract with the group purchasing organization. And then all those uh, sub-agents, they have customers, of course, because um, a consumer uh, wants to have a new mortgage for a new house or an old house or the same house, all kinds of uh, mortgages you have. And here you can see, so if a, a customer is uh, putting or asking for a new mortgage, he might want to see what the status of his mortgage is. And uh, the, the, the state diagram of a mortgage is rather complex. So there are a lot of states, and a, a cust for a customer it's really interesting to see at what stage his mortgage is. Yeah, where it's already approved at the notary and all that kind of things. But you never want to have that customer one can see the mortgage of another customer. Well, here accounts the same. So a sub-agent has multiple customers and he put the orders at the, uh, the, the, the group purchasing organization. Um, but uh, he wants to see his own mortgages, but not the own mortgages of anyone else. But also within sub-agents, you have uh, sub-agents with subs subsidiaries, hmm? with um, more locations, for instance. So you have, within the sub-agents, you might have um, a headquarter location and multiple sub-locations. And what happens then is that they all put their orders to the, the group purchasing organization, but this one is not allowed to see the mortgages of that one. So they all fell into the same uh, headquarter organization because you want to have that added to each other. But if you give access uh, to the mortgages, then the requirement often was that this subagent was not allowed to see the mortgage of that subagent. But again here, uh, the headquarters wants to see all mortgages of all subagents. And the uh, level up, it's, it's the same in fact. And so at the, the group purchasing organization, you want to see all mortgages, of course. So now you see that's becoming rather difficult because at the moment that the customer is, is asking for a mortgage and the mortgage is put into the system, all the security has to be correct because then it, it is available and you can retrieve it again and you don't want to have it retrieved by someone who's not allowed to see it. Okay? So that means from that moment it has to be done. So that's not so easy okay? because how are you going to do that? How do you know um, this customer is part of okay, this single uh, sub-agency so a sub, sub agency effect of this sub agency of this GPO. Hmm? Now at least it's clear that you have to assign from from the single moment it's uh, fed into the system, uh, this this object. You have to uh, assign directly the correct, um, yeah, how you call that, uh, owner attributes or uh, who is, who is um, allowed to have access to this instance. 
absolutely. Yeah. Because you cannot do that runtime. You cannot define that uh, runtime again and again. That's another way to do it. So you have already have to assign it to that single instance. So here you have a permission list, yeah, something like that. Permission. It's too hard to determine it over and over again if you, if you need it. You cannot, you cannot do that. Yeah, that's good. But who, how do you get this? What do you mean, how do you get this? How do you determine it? How do you determine it? Yeah. Because the other, f um, what you also want to think about is that you make a generic system. So if you make a system for a single business, a single customer, uh, you can uh, make everything more or less hard coded. Hmm? Let me call that. Like you say, okay, we do it for that business and it works in that business, it works like this and that. So we can really program it. Uh, but it becomes harder when you want, want to make it a generic system. So you can apply it to business one, and to business two, and to business three, over and over again. And if you can do that, it will be much more flexible too. So if the business changes, then it's probably not so hard for the business it's to, to still use the same system. And that also might be important in um, um, uh, joint ventures, for instance, or selling of your business to another party, and things like that. So then it's easier to integrate systems in whether they are not generic. Hmm? But this is in fact, it is software security, as you can see, because it, it has to be integrated within the business information system itself. If you don't do that, it's tremendously hard to, uh, to define all those rules and to have, uh, to have it maintained. Yeah? Yeah? So it has to be incorporated within the business uh, information system itself. Any questions? Any remarks? <laughs> Is this clear so far? Yeah. It's clear that it's, it's not so easy to solve? No. no. It looks easy. It might look easy, but it isn't. And therefore, again, You easily have this. Hmm? It's clear. And, and whether this is really the reason, the um, contour dot, I can't use the word, but who uh, <laughs> assures me that that's the reason? What's the reason? The reason is a program um, deficiency. Hmm? Let me call it like that. Yeah. And the same accounts uh, here. Maybe there's a, a link to the newspaper article. Well, all of the books are written about it. But but as you can see, that's, it's so complex and therefore these things happen very, very, very easily. Yeah. Any questions from there? No? Okay. So this was my uh, little lecture about, um, well, asset protection, in fact, and uh, how you might implement uh, that and how complex it is. Because if you, have, if you have all your assets as business objects, you can imagine that if you're... Because the most of the employees and external parties are accessing your, uh, your data and your assets through a business information system. So if that's the only thing that they are accessing all kind of data and information, then you can regulate it yeah, from there. And if you can do that, so if you have built it in uh, very flexible, then all the rules itself are also in the system. And then you can say, okay, you can access this. It could be an Excel document or 
an invoice PDF or a, a, a real business object could, could be anything then. And then you don't have to worry about is, is someone able to access a file system or a network or a printer, you see, because they, those are then parts of the, of the whole business information system. They're incorporated into the business information system. And therefore, when, once they are incorporated into the business information system itself, you can um, put all the security and access rules in there too. And it's not need then to put them at the lower level, yeah, distinct from where all the information is. So that, that's my idea about yeah, how you really should do it. With uh, our back and uh, business information system, if you're wise, you build your business exactly that you can incorporate everything. Yeah, but it's not necessary then uh, to do it on that level too, because, exactly, because it becomes one layer. in our back, in fact, you're going to say, okay, you're allowed to access this printer here. Huh? And you're allowed to access that piece of equipment, whatever it is. But the rules are then in here. Yeah, exactly. So you are allowed to execute an action on a specific instance and doing that action will uh, trigger uh, some things on, on pieces of equipment. So, so you don't need that layer, you, you need kind of functionality what's within there, but you don't need that layer in fact anymore. Yeah. Okay, well thank you for your attention. Um,